There are a number of us in this room that know nuggets of what's going on in the Choptank River, and so we have a plethora of background and knowledge coming forth. And our first is Dr. Tom Fisher, and he is with the Center for Environmental Science at, Horn, at the Horn Point Laboratory at the University of Maryland, and he's going to provide us with the grounding, if you will, of where we are on the chop tank. Thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do is first to acknowledge all the people who have made contributions to the talk that I'm about to give. So it's not just, uh, it wasn't me collecting all these samples and, uh, um, and also the funding agencies that have, pro have provided support for um, the, uh, uh, for the data that I'm about to show you. So an outline of my talk is I was asked to give an overview of the status and trends of water quality in the, in the chop tank. So I'm going to show you data from several, um, um, from several watersheds, the USGS gauge at Greensboro and several others that we've been sampling and I'll talk about those individually and I'll also talk about the estuary and how it responds to these, to these inputs. I'm going to talk a bit at the end about, about the People and Water Project, which is a uh, project funded by NSF that I, I've been working on. Okay, so um, let's get oriented. So here's the Chesapeake Bay. The Chop Tank is the, one of the largest watersheds on the eastern shore of the bay, and this is a blow up of that. So this is the estuarine tidal portion in, in blue. Um, I'm going to be talking primarily about watersheds in the upper part. The dark colored polygon is the USGS gauging station at Greensboro. We have about a 50 year record of water quality there. And I'm going to also talk about these smaller polygons are watersheds that we have gauged and monitored for, for over a decade. So I'm going to start with those. And um, the Greensboro watershed is about half forested, half agriculture. The, our other watersheds are all agriculturally dominated, 60 to 80 percent remainder is forest with a small residential area. And then we also have a forested watershed. It's a, it's a, a reference watershed in the, in the Nanticoke Basin that's, that's uh, is very close by. So it, it's a, a useful comparison to the others. So here's the record at the U.S. Geological uh, Survey gauging station at Greensboro. The monitoring began in the 60s, so we have a long record of nitrate. This is nitrate in blue, total nitrogen in red, uh, total phosphorus in green, and phosphate in whatever brown, red color that is. Um, and what you can see in this graph is that nitrogen and phosphorus have been increasing. These are annual average values, uh, water year values. Um, and it's a very simple way of showing the data, but you can see that nitrogen and phosphorus have been increasing monotonically over that entire period. There's, there's some blips in this record, but basically st statistically they're all increasing. And I'll note that Joel Blomquist will be talking a bit later. He analyzes the same data with a, uh, a more uh, sophisticated um, statistical method and comes to the same, same conclusions. That is, nitrogen and phosphorus are increasing at the station over time, despite whatever uh, actions are going on within, the, within that basin. So these are some of the smaller watersheds that I showed you uh, earlier. These are ones that we've monitored since about 2003. And unlike the other, the other, the other graph was annual averages. This is, these are individual monthly samples, and so it's all, this is raw data. You can see there's a lot of seasonal variability and a lot of ups and downs. But in this particular one, this is total nitrogen. Here's a, it's, it's a milligrams per liter over here, parts per million or, or milligrams per liter. And you can see that there was a tendency for nitrogen to be increasing over time till about 2008. And since then, it's starting, we have a slight downward trend. So this is some, some good news that, that maybe some of the things that are happening in this watershed are, are starting to reduce the amount of nitrogen that's actually leaving the watershed. For phosphorus, we see um, uh, very low concentrations. This is what's called base flow sampling. It's when it has not rained for three days. So the water in the stream is all groundwater that's leaving. There's very little phosphorus in groundwater 
when we look at base flow phosphorus, we're looking at maybe 10% of the phosphorus actually exits. Most of the phosphorus exits the watershed during about, let's say, 90% exits during um, storm, brief periods of storm flow. So concentrations of phosphorus go up by a factor of 10 or 20 during uh, storm events. And so we're only looking, when we do base flow sampling, we're only looking at a small fraction of phosphorus. But there's no trend in the, in the, the base, flow, base flow phosphorus. Another example, <clears throat> so nitrogen is in, increasing, <clears throat> uh, it was increasing, now it's decreasing in the watershed. Phosphorus is unchanged. Here's another, another watershed uh, where phosphorus is, is higher still. You notice now we're up to about six or seven milligrams per liter. This one is, again, a lot of variability, uh, periods when there's been large increases and then large decreases. But over the, this 13-year uh, record or so, we've got uh, an, uh, just a, a continuous increase in, of nitrogen at this watershed. Um, and for phosphorus, the, the record is about the same, lots of variability, but no long-term trends. Again, this is the base flow component representing all, only a small fraction of the phosphorus that's exported. Uh, I could show you lots of these. Oh, I keep forgetting about that. I could show you lots of these. What I'm going to do is summarize those 15 agricultural watersheds that I talked about, and then the Greensboro Station, as well as the Forested Basin. So here's the status. So if you look at the average concentration and, and chop tank, ag-dominated uh, watersheds, the mean nitrogen is about 4.7 milligrams per liter. The forested watershed is about a factor of 10 lower. Um, at Greensboro, we're about 1.9 or so for uh, the amount of nitrogen that's present. That's, this is like the last two or three years for current status. Uh, just for comparison, the Susquehanna River at Conowingo is is less than what's in the chop tank. So all of these sources, these two sources, ag-dominated watersheds and Greensboro, which integrates over forest and ag over a larger area, they're higher than, what's, than what is, uh, is present um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Susquehanna River. Um, for phosphorus, the concentrations, again, this is base flow. The highest one is right at Greensboro, and it's um, the, whereas the forested and the Forested one is about three times lower than the ag-dominated ones. Again, this is base flow, so we're still looking at a small fraction, but it tells you something about what's happening. So the trends in these watersheds, um, in the agriculturally dominated watersheds, we have eight of the 15 show some improving water quality, much like the, the slide I, sh I showed you uh, a few slides ago. So that's good news. So we're seeing some evidence that about half of the watersheds are, in fact, having reduced or slightly reduced nitrogen. These are not big trends, they're small trends, but they're hopeful signs. Uh, about five of them have no significant change, and about two of them are sh show degrading water quality. So you can think of this as maybe half of these ag-dominated watersheds show some improvement in water quality, and half show either no change or actually, actually degrading water quality. Um, just for comparison, Greensboro shows nitrogen and phosphorus increasing in both. Uh, I've got to mention phosphorus has almost uh, most of the, the, the trends in the ag watersheds show no change. One is improving, one is not improving. Um, uh, so, and the forested watershed so shows almost no change. So what we have here is a, is a uh, there's some hope that some of these watersheds are improving, but at least half of them either show no change or are, uh, the water quality is getting worse. So we have a mixed picture, and maybe that's why, the reason why why Bobby is, is, is confused about some of these is because we don't have a clear, we have a clear signal at Greensboro that that watershed is, is, is getting worse, but some of the others are improving and some are not. Um, what I want to take a look now is, so we've, we've looked at what's happening up here. So we have a mixture of trends, nitrogen and phosphorus increasing from this area. Some of these show improvements, some don't. So let's look at what's happening in the estuary downstream. So all this land is draining down to this down to this station, and this is where the estuary widens and, and deepens and stratified. So it's where the expression of the nitrogen and phosphorus coming into it is, is shown. This is a summary of some, some DNR data. These are annual averages. This is chlorophyll A, which is an index of algal biomass, how much phytoplankton is present in the estuary. And what you can see is that the annual average chlorophyll A has been increasing systematically since about 1985. That means the waters are greener than they have been in the past. 
The dissolved oxygen in bottom waters, this is summer dissolved oxygen, so it's June, July, August, the, the deepest part of the, of, the, of the profile in the water column. You can see that there's been a tendency for that to get, to have less and less oxygen present in the, um, in, in, in the bottom waters of the chop tank. And it's approaching this 30-day water quality criterion that the Bay Program uses. Secchi depth is a, in, is a measure of water transparency. So this is depth in meters. So this is about three or four feet of water visibility when a, a disk is no longer visible. And you can see that that has been getting, there's a lot of ups and downs in this, but basically it's been getting shallower over time. Now one of the things you may see in this, if you've been, if been looking carefully, is that some of these points at the very end, the, in fact, for the chlorophyll record, these are, all, these are all high flow years, these are all low flow years on the bottom. So this means that the water flow from the chop tank is driving the amount of algal biomass that's present in the estuary. Uh, but these points out here are a little bit lower than you would expect based on the amount of river flow. And you can see that oxygen has been increasing here a bit at the end. And you'll note this remarkable water quality that we had last year. 2015 was a year when the bay as a whole was very clear. We had a nice dry end of summer, end of fall. Uh, and that resulted in very clear water. People were seeing the bottoms of, in, off their docks that they hadn't been seeing for years. And so we have some hopeful sign here that there's a recent tendency for water quality in the estuary to be improving. So there, we have this long history of degradation going on, but some hopeful signs for what's there now. So just to summarize this, I think I've said all this, but uh, so that we've had negative tendencies for nitrogen and phosphorus in some of these streams, but they're, some of them are showing some uh, uh, changes going on. Uh, and whereas in, in the estuary, we're seeing some recent improvements that may be uh, signs of a, uh, that we've turned a corner and we're, we're seeing some improvements in water quality. But there's this long history of degradation that we really have to deal with. We have to be careful that we don't lose this, uh, the improving water quality that seems to be occurring right now. Um, now, a couple years ago, we wrote a proposal. We, it was before we saw any of these signs of improving water quality. And we wrote a proposal saying the chop tank seems to be getting worse despite the activities that are going on, the attempts to improve water quality. Do, are the BMPs that we've been installing actually working? We've been, lots of BMPs have been installed. As, as, as Bobby's shown, farmers are doing lots of things. Are we actually, are we doing the right things? Are we doing enough of them? Do they actually work? And so we got funded for uh, five years by, by National Science Foundation to look at how well best management practices actually work. We have, of the, of the 15 watersheds that, we've, that I showed you earlier, we chose four as our watersheds. We have a control watershed. We have three experimental ones which we, in which we are trying to put in more best management practices on top of what's already there and then monitor what actually happens. So we monitor right on the farms where uh, the best management practices have gone on. We monitor downstream from there. We monitor the outlets of these watersheds. The watershed scale is the right place to be seeing, are we, are we in fact improving water quality when we do these things? <clears throat> so, um, so this was, the main question is, will increased best management practices affect water quality? Uh, in, uh, will we be able to affect any of these trends that I was showing you earlier? Can we see, can we get improvements in water quality at the watershed scale? We have a sociology and economics component. I won't be talking about that here today. Uh, and most of what we do is direct water quality measurements at, at these three different scales. Um, you can see someone sampling from a, a tile drain. This is uh, sampling from a, a ditch. And then um, that's a sampling a groundwater under a farm. And you'll note some of our farmers have these signs up which say they're part of our project and they're, they're allowing us to sample on their property, which is a big deal to, get, to trust us enough to gather data right on their farm. So what are the best management practices? There's a whole, whole list of them here. You can read them faster than I can say. I'll just describe some of them. Cover crops are one. Uh, green seeker is a uh, form of precision agriculture. This is a, a, a drainage control structure in the, uh, in the ground. You, only, you don't see much of it. You, don't, you only see the, the top part of it. But it's a way of backing up water uh, onto a farm to preserve the water for the summer when, when the crops need it. And also it, it induces a process of 
denitrification, which removes some of the nitrate that would otherwise be leaving from the farm. This is a bioreactor. Uh, Tim Rosen from, uh, from Mitchell River, River Keepers installed this on in, in one of our experimental watersheds. Um, this is a, 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 line, a, a grass line ditch, a drainage area, and this is an experimental one. It's a, um, a solar powered aerator that, that aerates a farm pond that we hope will take out, lock up some of the phosphorus in the bottom and induce the process of nitrification during the day when the aerator is going and then denitrify it at night when the aerator is not going. It's a solar powered unit with no battery. So we don't know how well that one's going to work, but we're about to find out in the next couple of years. So what progress have we made? One of the really positive things I've found is that the farming community is very interested in knowing how well these best manager practices work. Two-thirds of the farmers in our watersheds are, are working with us in some way. They've allowed us to go onto their property, um, put in uh, groundwater wells, sample the groundwater, sample their ditches, sample their tile drains. We've had great responses from the agricultural community. I have to say that if any of you are residents in that area, we've had 5% of the residents work with us, despite repeated efforts. So the residential community has not been very responsive, but the farmers have been great to work with. We've managed to install 26 new best management practices in these experimental watersheds. And these, are, these watersheds are about six square miles, so they're not very big. So 26 uh, best management practices on top of what's already there is a, uh, a significant number. Um, we've, done, we do month, we've done monthly baseload monitoring since 2003. That should be 2000. Well, we began in 2013 when the project began. Uh, we also do episodic storm flow monitoring. So storm flow is really important for phosphorus transport. And we, be we began that in 2013. Our funding started here in October. Uh, the overarching goal that we have is really to move these watersheds towards environmentally, socially, economically sustainable watersheds. In other words, uh, farming and water quality are not necessarily at opposite ends of the spectrum. It is possible to have uh, agriculture with, with clean water quality. And that's what we're trying to move forward to as we, uh, as we work with the farmers in our watershed and, and test whether, how well these best manager practices work. So if there are any questions, I'll be glad to take them. Tom, I'm going to ask that when the next panel is finished, if you'll join that panel, so that if there are questions that are uh, drawn up in the meantime, you'll be up there to answer them. Thank you.